what's up everybody? Welcome to Found Flicks. On this Ending Explained, we'll be looking at Suspiria, a remake of the classic 1977 film, where a young woman joins a Berlin dance troupe and uncovers a supernatural conspiracy. I love Dario Argento's original Suspiria and was definitely skeptical when the remake was announced. While admittedly not perfect, the plot is pretty much non-existent, there is so much to love about the original, and to me is the gold standard of the Italian giallo genre. And honestly, it's one of my absolute favorite horror movies of all time. I'm also a massive fan of director Argento. I mean, in addition to directing and producing a bunch of classics, he helped Dawn of the Dead get financing. I mean, come on, pretty much the best zombie movie of all time. And even when I was in Rome, that's right, you know, in Italy, for one day, one of my absolute must-visit locations was Profondo Rosso, a store dedicated to everything Argento, including a basement museum narrated by a voiceover from the director, filled with props from his various films, and run by his longtime friend Luigi Cossi, who was more than happy to meet us and take a picture after we bought a shitload of stuff. The most impressive being this wooden box style version of Suspiria. Just look at this thing. Gorgeous. All of that to say, I'm a longtime fan of the original movie. So when I even heard of someone considering remaking the movie, I'm like, Pleh! get the hell out of here. What are you doing, you fool? And for a while, it actually seemed like the remake would never come to light. And at one point, even had David Gordon Green attached as director, who would later go on to direct the extremely successful new Halloween. Good for him. Despite all my built-up vitriol for pointless remakes of beloved movies, the new Suspiria is much more distinct and successful than I had ever expected, and was able to stand on its own. Not your typical nostalgia-fueled remake hinging on redoing the original at every turn. While it does keep the same basic story, framework, and mythology of its predecessor, the basic beats are all there, but it is executed in a dramatically different feel and tone than the original. Perhaps best known for its garish, overly saturated Technicolor look with bold colors popping off the screen and a dominating prog rock synth soundtrack from the band Goblin, the remake goes in the complete opposite direction stylistically, with a bleak, heavily muted gray color palette that makes everything feel cold and distant, accompanied by a haunting, more simplistic score from Radiohead's Tom York. Though I did also appreciate that it went out of its way to evoke the camera styles of 1977, like snap zooms and split diopter lenses, something not in fashion now, but were in the past. These little touches add a lot to the film, making it almost feel more timeless in a way. As such, it manages to be respectful in paying homage to the first and utilizing aspects of the original story in many ways, while also going into a wide wildly different direction as well. For example, sure, we don't have the legendary Udo Kier as a police investigator, but this time we have Tilda Swinton filling the same basic role, and playing a man flawlessly. In fact, playing three roles, Madame Blanc, Dr. Klimperer, and Mother Marcos. The makeup, along with her performance, is almost too good, honestly. The image of a shirtless Tilda with old age man makeup, all wrinkly and shit, is one that will truly haunt me for some time. Because I'm like, that looks like an old man, but it's really a lady? Now I'm just confused. Just shows how damn good of an actress Swinton really is to fill these three quite different roles effortlessly. However, the movie winds up feeling a bit overstuffed, running at a massive two hours and 15 minutes. It tries to tackle too much in its scope, but it's the political undertone that sticks out in particular. As much of the story takes place in the shadow of the Berlin Wall, including several real life events during 1977 in the background, it seems intended to add more dramatic weight and a historical context to the story, but ultimately feels more like it drags things down, without really ever connecting to the main plot. It's not enough to really impact things too much, but at times made me wish it had been cut down by about 20 minutes, or develop these themes a bit more than how they ultimately panned out. Anyway, enough of my general thoughts on the movie. Let's dig into the story, breaking down everything you need to know and explaining the ending, as well as comparing it to the drastically different ending of the original. You know the general plot, right? In Berlin, in the Marcos Dance Academy is actually secretly run by a coven of powerful witches. Their leader, Mother Marcos, most likely several hundred years old, is in need of a new body. So through the school, the matrons, including Madame Blanc, select certain members to become the new physical body for Marcos. Our story begins when a student from the academy and their most recent target of this, Patricia, visits her psychiatrist, Dr. Klimperer, in a panic state, frantically telling him that she has come to believe the heads of the academy are actually witches and have unsavory ritualistic intentions for her, which caused her to flee. Klimperer understandably doesn't believe her wild stories, thinking she must be losing her mind. Though when she disappears soon after, he 
becomes more interested in investigating what happened to her, as well as the supposed supernatural goings on at the academy. Still a buzz over the missing Patricia, a new student Susie arrives hoping to join the troupe. For Susie, it seems that throughout her life she has been inexplicably drawn to Berlin and the academy, as though it is her destiny. Originally a Mennonite living in Ohio with her ailing mother, Susie was more preoccupied with Berlin and left her simple life to come to Germany. Initially, the heads of the school aren't terribly interested in her auditioning, but once she shows off her dancing capabilities, they can't help but be impressed, inviting her to join them, and even catches the attention of the mysterious head instructor, Madame Blanc, in an entirely other room, seeming to feel Susie's unbridled power even now. And after this, she quickly takes a shine to her new student. For Susie, she naively has found herself living her dream that she's held her entire life, but there are more sinister underpinnings to her journey she is unaware of, as she becomes the next potential selection to become Marcos' vessel. The first signs of this occur during the troupe's next rehearsal. One member, Olga, becomes frustrated with Blanc and leaves in a huff finding herself trapped in a room surrounded by mirrors. To Blank's surprise, Susie already knows the steps for the dance the group is working on, having studied them in recordings she had back in Ohio. And turns out she has been a huge admirer of Blanc's career. Before demonstrating, she touches Susie's hands and feet, creating a small glow at the points, essentially transferring power to her, tied to her dance moves. That's right, dancing is deadly in this academy. Susie performs the intense routine, and each move correlates to an attack on the helpless Olga, flinging her around the room and breaking her bones, leaving her body a twisted and mangled mess. This sequence being by far the most horrific part of the film definitely sticks with you. Soon after we learn a bit more about how leadership works at the school and see that there is a power struggle going on between the heads of the academy. Madame Helena Marcos has been in charge of the school for assumedly hundreds of years and Blank is tired of her old school leadership, wanting to wrestle control away for herself. Unfortunately for her, when put to a vote, the majority agreed to leave Marcos in charge. Meanwhile, the clueless suit Susie continues to live her supposed dream, making friends with another girl, Sarah, and quickly rises through the ranks of the Academy, even getting the lead part in their next performance thanks to Blank taking her as her protege. Though she's obviously being carefully groomed as the next pawn in the ritual, and it seems they've finally found someone powerful enough to fit the bill. Elsewhere, Klimperer begins to dig deeper into the Academy, reading through a journal of notes left by Patricia detailing the witchcraft she saw there, and including mention of the Three Mothers, a trio of powerful ancient witches that have been around even before Christianity, Mother Suspiriorum, the Mother of Sighs, Mother Tenebrarum, Mother of Darkness, and Mother Lacrimarmum, the Mother of Tears, said to be the oldest and most powerful of the three. Suspiria, of course, focuses on Mother Suspiriorum, and Argento did go on to make spiritual sequels that explored the other two in 1980's Inferno and 2007's The Mother of Tears, respectively. Klimperer approaches Sarah with the new information he's gathered, and she too becomes suspicious after investigating the lower levels of the Academy, finding all sorts of ancient strange, ritualistic-looking items housed there, but catches a glimpse of the others in a meeting, her search for proof of their witchcraft temporarily put on hold. Then it's the night of the big performance of Volk, led by Susie. Klimperer goes to watch the show, while Sarah heads back down to the underground levels, passing deeper into catacombs, and there shockingly comes across the missing Patricia, weakened and with grayed skin, assumedly having her life force drained to feed Marcos. The witches are aware of her location, and when attempting to flee, they manifest holes in the floor, causing Sarah to painfully break her leg, incapacitating her. When the others arrive, they magically fix the injury and put her into a trance of sorts, seeing her eyes have changed colors. She joins the others in the middle of the show, performing her moves with a rigid robotic precision, only for her to eventually collapse to the ground, stopping the performance before completion. Klimperer horrified when he sees Sarah's changed eyes, and after Blank chastises Susie for not finishing the performance, as it interfered with their intended manipulation of Sarah. Chances are they were probably trying to kill her, I would guess. Though the performance was only a small part of their plan in the scheme of things, as the witches have decided Susie is finally ready for her purpose to become the new vessel of the ailing body of Marcos. Under the guise of a celebratory dinner, it appears that the matrons put each of the other girls into a trance as Sarah had been, needing them as well to carry out the ritual, because there's gotta be primal crazy dancing going on naturally. They also need a witness, and feel that Klimperer is a perfect choice. Visiting his second home, he's shocked to find his long-missing wife Anka there waiting for him 
who in a very cool bit of casting is played by Jessica Harper, the original Susie. But this is all just a ruse, as she vanishes, merely a creation of the matrons to lure him to the academy where they need him. Susie is taken down to a cavern, the other girls dancing frantically in their trance states, along with Sarah, Patricia, and Olga, all ready for their Sabbath to begin. As it starts, Blank seems to sense that something is amiss, and wants to stop the ritual. But Marcos won't allow this, having her attacked and Blank is nearly decapitated. She was right to be worried as an assured Susie first renounces her own mother, seeing her finally pass from her illness back in Ohio. And Susie proceeds to rip her chest open, seeing only darkness inside, surprisingly revealing she is inhabited by Mother Suspiriorum, not Marcos as we have been led to believe this whole time, who is obviously still a powerful witch in her own right, but not at the level of the three mothers. Suspiriorum through Susie is here to actually destroy Marcos along with those that follow her and take over the academy, summoning a form of death, a black figure that slinks on the ground and proceeds to kill Marcos followers, and leaving Blank behind. She also bestows mercy upon the suffering Patricia, Sarah, and Olga, who all beg to die, which she grants them ending their pain caused by Marcos' cruel hand. Now there is a new mother in town, and after this great upheaval of power, things return to relative normalcy at the academy, and somehow Blank survives her injuries found by another matron. Our final scene once again shows a side of compassion to Mother Suspiriorum, visiting the now bedridden Klimperer, and details to him the truth about what happened to his wife. That she didn't go on to a new life in London, but in reality was killed at a German concentration camp after forgetting to bring her papers along. Don't! Rather than allow him to live with this painful information, Susie touches his forehead, sending Klimperer into a seizure that empties his memory, and she vanishes, seen outside the academy looking satisfied. So there's no doubt that Susie becomes inhabited by Mother Suspiriorum, and also that this was a surprise to the matrons, including Marcos and Blanc, during the Sabbath, since the original purpose was for Marcos to take over Susie's body as her vessel. The question is, did at some point during the story did Suspiriorum take over, or was the mother of size always within Susie? I'd say the latter. There appears to be a real overarching destiny to Susie's story, even since as a child she was drawn inexplicably to Berlin, and was naturally the most gifted and powerful dancer of the group. They've been waiting for someone strong enough to be Marcos' vessel, and Susie does fit the bill in this regard. But based on how things turn out, it really seems like Suspiriorum has been a part of her the entire time, and it was her spirit that guided Susie throughout her life her destiny being to overthrow the academy and take over. Perhaps Susie wasn't aware of why she was being drawn to Berlin and dancing, but after some time at the academy and working with Blank, this kind of awakened the power of Suspiriorum that had been lying dormant within her. So it's really the fault of the matrons for trying to sacrifice Susie that in fact became their own undoing. And it was due to their abuse of power that vengeance was needed in the first place. At least that's what makes the most sense to me based on what we are presented with in the story. In the end, leaving everything wide open for or further potential sequels with Susie as the new leader of the Academy. On the other hand, the original has a very different and much more conclusive ending. After learning the story of Marcos being considered a witch, Susie returns to the school where the others are all attending a ballet. Finding her way through a hidden passage in the wall, she overhears of Blanks and the others plans to kill her. After finding her friend Sarah dead, she hides in another room, hearing someone else in there with her, Mother Marcos, who here is Mother Suspiriorum. Accidentally awakening her, Marcos summons the spirit of Sarah to attack, but Susie is able to make out the shape of Marcos in the flashes of lightning and stabs her in the neck with a peacock quill, killing her and Sarah vanishes. With her death, as Susie has told earlier, the coven cannot survive without its leader, and the academy begins to crumble around her, seeing that Blank and the rest of Marcos's matrons are killed as the school is engulfed in flames, a smiling Susie walking outside as the fire destroys the building. So kind of the opposite again to the remake. Instead of Susie being taken over, she destroys Marcos and all of her followers, and the school. Dang, you go girl. And while the other spiritual sequels feature the other mothers, there is not too much continuity between them. And with that, we have reached the conclusion of this ending explained on Suspiria. I surprisingly liked it a lot more than I expected, especially being such a huge fan of the original, and honestly wouldn't be opposed to seeing more movies set in the universe they have established. They have mentioned the potential of a prequel involving Mother Marcos taking place in 1200, which could be cool too, and take things once again into an entirely new direction within the series. Make sure to send any video requests my way on my social Social media platforms at Foundflix. Thanks guys! What did you guys think of the movie and its ending? How do you think it compared to the original? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Make sure to like, subscribe, and follow. Thanks for watching Foundflix. See you next time.